Uh, well, thanks to everyone for staying this long. I really appreciate it. I'm honored. And I think it's last and by all means least, is sometimes what I say. So first, I have a really important question to ask before I go ahead. And the question is, aren't Carl and Richard just the coolest? Okay. So I guess the pointer's not working, so I'll do this. Okay, there's the title, yeah, and I was going to go into some heavy technical stuff, and we'll see in a minute, but I've also included a story, because I'm Irish, so I'm going to tell you an old yarn as well, okay? Hopefully that will be enjoyable. Uh, so this is the material after cover, and uh, I'm going to go... To <laughs> I'm, I love this stuff, and I, I want to go through it in tortuous detail for 39 minutes, and then I'll do some light stuff at the end, okay? Um, that's a joke. Uh, this would happen, without a doubt, <laughs> especially late in the afternoon. So we'll go ahead and we'll do something a little different. And I'll tell you a story myself and how I got into this game back in 2013. Uh, and I hope you find it interesting. And there's a little bit of science in there too, so it's not just a personal story. So here was me going in to get standard blood test results back in 13. And uh, it's not a perfect likeness, I never wear a tie. But uh, that was essentially how I felt, because for many years I'd passed all my blood tests and they looked okay. So I was here in my mid-40s, feeling good. And here's a few measurements that were turned out to be interesting. Uh, GGT, a liver enzyme, serum ferritin, and iron loading in the blood, and of course our old friend cholesterol. And when I actually got the results from the doctor or the MD, they were like this. <laughs> So I've been 25 years kind of leading teams in complex problem solving and data and that. And although I didn't know much about this sphere, I knew because I could see the lab reference ranges that these were really, really high. I mean, they were outside the, the bounds. So I kind of got a bit annoyed because I realized I'm hitting the jackpot here. Now, as I'm talking to the doctor and uh, they're going through the stuff, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, hold on a minute, you know, I'm thinking about the numbers. And I know one thing straight away, that these numbers are so unusual, there will be some primary root causes. Not 50 causes, there'll be one, maybe two primary root causes, because that's the way it works. No matter how complex the system is, there's a few primaries. Uh, and I immediately was thinking, I'm gonna have to find those. So I began to grill the doctor, uh, probably more aggressively than the average uh, patient, but uh, I was, I was civil about it. And what I got from, uh, from questioning fairly deeply was maybe hemochromatosis, because Irish people, it's common, it's an iron loading disease where you hyperabsorb iron from your gut, and iron is toxic when it goes to high levels and it destroys your organ systems. So hemochromatosis people often die in their 50s and 60s from organ failure. So that was a bit worrying, but I figured, well, at least I got it now. Uh, reduce the wine intake, because most doctors really associate high GGT with excessive alcohol use. Now, that grossly underestimates its importance as a marker, as I later discovered. Uh, it's a simplistic view. And then eat more healthy whole grains for the cholesterol, maybe. So a bit of that old cholesterol rubbish. Right. And I went to a second doctor, because I wasn't happy with this, while I waited for the hemochromatosis test results. So again, I got hemochromatosis. I was still waiting for the results. Reduced the wine intake. So we see again the docs, GGT, wine, you know, alcohol. And made, this person said, well, you reduce the fat, you know, because for the cholesterol, you know, a bit more of that riff. So I still wasn't happy. And I went to a third doctor, a very uh, experienced person. And pretty much the same stuff, right? Now, interestingly, the third doctor said he'd been seeing serum ferritin rising inexorably and steadily over the past 30 years in Ireland, particularly in middle-aged men. And he was really, he was wondering what it was because he got them all tested for hemochromatosis and most of them were negative. So he was curious as to what that was, what was going on. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I was able to go back and explain it all to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So anyway, uh, that's actually true. Uh, so we go ahead. 
This is how I react when uh, the experts do not know and when I'm brought in to lead a complex problem. You know, I tend to get frustrated. But what I have to do in those instances, I have to get all the raw data from the problem and I have to analyze it myself. So in this case, I realized it's the same as my work world. I'm going to have to research this myself because if the experts don't have any clear guidance, and by the way, I got a negative hemochromatosis test, so basically I got jack. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to research it. Now, I have a biochemical engineering degree, and I've been working with data and complex problem solving a long time, so I felt I can go and do this just like uh, I do in my work world. You'll see there in ResearchGate, which I had a corporate log on to, uh, there's over 10,000 publications on ferritin, so there's plenty of science out there, and I know how to analyze it. Uh, there's actually around 58 million for cholesterol, and uh, half of those at least are rubbish. but. Uh, I went in and I began to research. So the first one was cholesterol, right? Which I didn't know much about, but apparently I was high. But very quickly I found the Hunt study from Europe, and the last I checked I was a European, so this was European, 60,000 over a couple of decades. And basically for men in blue, and for women particularly in red, the higher the cholesterol, the lower the all-cause mortality, with no exception. Right? And it was the same for cardiovascular mortality. So I knew that a correlation with cholesterol must be very ambiguous because if you get an anti-correlation, there just can't be a major problem here. So I dug a little deeper uh, into the LDL and I found out that if your LDL is high, and sorry, this is in millimoles, um, over to the right of the diagram there in the x-axis, 5.68, if your LDL is right up to 250 milligrams, but your HDL is high, there's no risk. I've marked it in green there, and this is middle-aged men in Framingham, right? And that's kind of type of person I was. So I realized that the ratio was crucial because LDL means almost nothing without the HDL. I didn't fully understand why yet. So I moved on to GGT because I could see cholesterol at best was an ambiguous and probably noisy nuisance. GGT, however, was really high. I was in the top centile. I researched and I found uh, and I'll just remind people, any associational study with a marker, you want to, if you're over a 2x odds ratio, it, it, you got to take it seriously. I mean, cholesterol might be a 1.2x risk for being higher, and that doesn't really mean much. But if you're over 2x, it's significant and may speak to cause. So, some of the first papers I got in GGT, this one here on heart failure, showed 3x for being above the median. Now, that's not like in the very top strata where I was, that was just being in the upper half, was a 3x risk. And I knew from experience, okay, that's pretty serious. So I dug some more, and I got this on coronary artery disease, biggest killer in the world. And you can see there, there's a 7x for being in the top quartile. And you can see the tightness of the error bars. That's a pretty hefty odds ratio, right? And it's straight linear all the way up. So now I know this GGT is serious. Here's one from the early 2000s, the Minnesota study, and nine times the risk in the top quartile or quintile of GGT for coronary artery disease. And I've already checked out cholesterol and the odds ratios are trivial. So I'm kind of a little disappointed with my doctors at this stage. And this one kind of took the biscuit. So for my BMI, being in the upper quartile, and I was, a, I was at the top of it, was a 15x risk for future type 2 diabetes. And I knew that was a serious disease. I later found out it causes most cardiovascular disease. Uh, so this kind of shocked me, really. And you can see the interaction between body weight and GGT quartile. It, GGT dominates the diabetes scene. So I was pretty angry. <laughs> uh, to say the least. But I moved on to ferritin and I figured, well, that can't be too bad, right? Not so. For serum ferritin, the top quintile is a 5x risk for atherosclerosis in this study, and many studies. And you'll notice that when they adjusted for other factors, you can see the solid versus dotted line, didn't even change it. So it had a strongly independent association with atherosclerosis, and 5x is a big deal. This one's interesting. You've got low LDL on the left there, below 200, and high LDL on the right, above 200 milligrams, right? They're really high LDL. But you'll notice in this study, they have no difference in risk. The bars are the same height, until you look at their ferritin. Now the high ferritin people in black with high LDL have a huge multiplier, 
and even the low LDL people have a multiplier, right? So the ferritin is kind of mediating all the relationship between LDL and risk. And that makes sense mechanistically because I went deep in the following months. You know, it's in a strong indicator of inflammatory physiology. So that kind of got me. And this one for carotid arteriosclerosis, nice study. High ferritin, 10x the risk in this study. And I don't show the premenopausal women there, but everyone pretty much knows the premenopausal women have a much lower risk for heart disease, right? And I kind of argue what it is. But I'll tell you one thing, the premenopausal women here who had high ferritin had a 10x risk as well, and they had no protection, because the problem of atherosclerosis is an inflammatory one, as indicated by ferritin, not so much cholesterol. So now I'm really annoyed, because I've kind of got two bingos. Okay, I can write off the cholesterol, but I got two pretty nasty risk factors. So I was in Singapore on a business trip, just following this first month of research, uh, and I had crabs back then as well. A chili crab, pepper crab. <laughs> yeah, jumbo seafood, Singapore, I recommend it. Delicious pepper crab. So anyway, I'm mulling over this. You can see I was around 35 pounds uh, heavier than I am now. And uh, you can see I was a pretty angry young man. Uh, <laughs> no one wanted to come near me <laughs> during that period. But what I did was for the next few weeks, I dug even deeper and I went down many rabbit holes and I found out or discovered the metabolic or insulin resistance syndrome. And I realized it was enormously important in today's disease world and no one had mentioned it. I realized it made a joke of cholesterol. I mean, the cholesterol isn't really in the metabolic syndrome criteria because it just doesn't really get in there. And low fat diets made no sense for this type of problem which is near universal in our world today. And I realized we'd all been misled for decades. I mean, totally misled. Everything I thought about health was utterly upside down after my research. So I then had a eureka moment. And uh, what I realized, well, not realized, what you do when you create a hypothesis and it's robust and you've triangulated all the data is you test the hypothesis with an experiment. But first what you can do is test it with a virtual experiment. You can predict something that must be true based on your research and then check is it true from the literature. So I did. I predicted and realized that serum ferritin GGT had to be powerful markers for metabolic syndrome, even though I hadn't yet seen that in research. So I went ahead with targeted uh, searching, and of course they were. On the left, ferritin here you see, and as you move across, you've got increasing criteria and severity of metabolic syndrome, and it's practically exponential for high ferritin. I won't read out on the right, but you can see where GGT fits in to metabolic syndrome, and a lot else, okay? So now I pretty much knew I was correct. So I went ahead with an intervention. And the intervention was going to be nutritional only because the docs had said alcohol, but I knew that I didn't drink a huge amount of alcohol. I liked my red wine. It didn't make any sense to me mechanistically or intuitively that the wine could cause this crazy uh, physiological response. It just didn't make sense. So I did nutritional only. I was on a relatively healthy high carb, lowish fat diet, and we eat well in our house, traditional Irish meals. Yeah, I had the odd pizza, and I certainly probably had a bit of milk chocolate now and then, and I drank a lot of juice, which I found out afterwards was kind of crazy. I did the intervention, and I switched to something I won't need to describe to you guys, right? It's a healthy fat, low carb diet, um, pretty much dark chocolate for treats and cut out all the juices and the sugars, okay? And you'll notice that I kept the wine constant, right? Because I didn't want to confound my experiment <laughs> by lowering the wine, yeah. <laughs> now, yeah, yeah, you could say, <laughs> for science, <laughs> I, I mean, you could say I had other reasons to, to do that, but no, it was, it was for science. Just like Dave. Just like Dave. So, anyway, what I did basically, and it's a cliche now I know, I inverted this guy, right? And I did the opposite. I did tailor it a little because I had a lot of knowledge now, and of course I, I tweaked out a lot of the fruits, the high sugar fruits, and of course I made sure the base was solid. <laughs> All right. I, I didn't want any poor foundations in this, this thing. So I went ahead, and here's the guy, insulin resistant, ferritin, GGT, belly, load of subcutaneous fat. I mean, look at those arms. 
And uh, that's not muscle, <laughs> believe me. Uh, and I went ahead and I said, right, nutritional intervention, what do we got? What are we going to get? So here's my really bad markers, and I know how bad they are now. So after eight weeks, right, not too surprising. Uh, but <laughs> and that's to be expected because that's the way the human body works. But anyway, but also the cholesterol, which I had begun to deep dive into, my metrics, sorry, they're in European units, were, were, which weren't too bad. Cholesterol didn't really show me up and my problems. They all got remarkably better, which makes sense because when you get true root causes and you address them in, in processes and engineering anywhere, often the thing you were fixing gets fixed, but many other beneficial effects occur, right? Because a true root cause uh, is just multifaceted, it will improve the whole system. <laughs> so so uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, for me, I was always mildly hypertensive, and I realized later that most idiopathic hypertension is hyperinsulinemia related. Uh, not a lot of people seem to know that. Uh, but I was always quite high unless I was training for triathlons, and then I get it down. But as soon as I wasn't training hard, it'd go back up again. Uh, but that came right down to really nice levels. And the body weight 35 pounds off and the waist down to around 32. Uh, interestingly, the blood pressure fell in the first week long before I lost weight because the blood pressure is not driven by the weight. The blood pressure is driven along with the weight by hyperinsulinemia and other problems. So that's, imp that's important to note. Root cause solution approved and we got to ask why. Why could I do that? Uh, it doesn't make any sense that the experts in the field of physiology can be so lost with standard blood tests, and then I can do that in a few weeks. And one reason is this turkey, <laughs> friend of ours, and he had a head full of uh, essentially junk science. Uh, but that's a big legacy, and the legacy is still powerful. Only a couple of weeks ago, the AHA have come out talking some junk about coconut oil, and it's actually absurd. Uh, it's, it's become comical, right, if you actually understand the science. So it's still going on, and, and you guys know that. So I'll go into beyond cholesterol then and some of these other things we've heard and look at more real, genuine drivers of heart disease. Now, I did do a talk uh, a few years ago with the cholesterol conundrum. It's over an hour long, but I went through all of the mechanisms of LDL and how the transport system works, and Dave is doing a fantastic job of bringing it to the next level, right? But um, it's on YouTube, and I went through HDL's function as well. It's extremely, extremely important. Uh, so you can Google that if you wish, but I won't make you go through it today. Instead, I'll bring in a pal of mine. He might not agree he's a pal, but uh, he's a top lipidologist in the States, uh, Thomas Dayspring, a huge pedigree, and he's a cholesterol expert. So I was delighted a couple of years ago when I questioned him on some things, and he clarified that the majority of heart attacks are due to, connected to, or related to insulin resistance, right? Not really cholesterol, and that was good. I knew that, but it was good to see. And LDL is a near worthless predictor for cardiovascular issues. And that could be very interesting to a lot of docs, right? They mightn't have heard that before. And if it's above 200, he'd claim it has relevance, but that's also debatable. But we didn't have to wait for Tom to come along because in 1996, William Castelli, director of Framingham, published a paper, and I have it, peer reviewed, and he said this, unless LDL is above 300, it has no real utility in itself of predicting an individual's risk. So he jacked up to 300. <laughs> and that's pretty big cholesterol, right? LDL alone, not total. No one wanted to hear him. He also said this, that the ratio of total to HDL, and he didn't get into trig over HDL, but it's very similar technically, is a far better predictor than any of the other metrics, not only in Framingham, but in physicians and many other studies. And it hasn't changed since. They all say the same thing, right? So the ratios are key. Why? I'll show you. Here's the women's health study, and you can see on the bottom the ratio of total, and you can also see the advanced lipoproteins that Dave referred to, and you can just see the ratios had much higher predictive power, and LDL is kind of in the dunce's seat up the top. And even that one in other studies, many studies shows no significance. In this one it showed a bit, right? And one of the reasons the ratios, or the main reason that they're so powerful from the panel, is this. And here is a good study, there are many. 
The ApoB over ApoA1 ratio, like total over HDL ratio, is a massive predictor of your level of insulin resistance. So the best thing you can get from cholesterol or even advanced lipoprotein tests by a country mile is, is you use them to predict your insulin sensitivity, right? And that's the irony. Most people think they're looking at cholesterol and they think it's cholesterol stuff. It's not, it's mostly this. So this misunderstanding going for 40 years is why we have this just a couple of months ago. So heart disease burden is going out of control. They're 15 years ahead of projections. Jeff mentioned 50% of Americans are gonna have heart disease in the coming years. And they even said it's outstripping their ability to combat it. <laughs> so I'd agree with Jeff, they need to take their head out of the cholesterol hole and start getting with the science. Okay, and maybe then we'd get some improvements. So part three, the real problem. Let's just dabble a little in the mechanisms of the real problem. So hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance is a state of being that is intimately connected to many modern chronic diseases, and particularly heart disease. This study by Reven was nice. It was a few hundred middle-aged people. They got them. They split them into tertiles or thirds of their insulin sensitivity, and they measure them with a very accurate steady state plasma glucose test, right, glucose infusion. And it's kind of like a Kraft test for, you may have heard about uh, Dr. Kraft, who was a good friend of ours. Uh, it's an accurate test. Fasting insulin and, and fasting glucose are not. This is a proper one. So we got to see some proper results. So what happened uh, seven years later is the lowest third of insulin uh, had no disease, no death, and actually no issues, which is unusual for a seven-year tracking of people in their 60s. You know, it's unusual because the problems went somewhere else. Well, here was the medium insulin people. They had a good bit of action going on. And here was the highest third off. So we basically perfectly, and the stats bear out here, there's a, a small numbers, but statistical significance is huge for the trend because there was such dramatic result. What were they diseases and deaths? Well, there were heart attacks, cancers, diabetes, of course, and severe hypertension. All the diseases of modernity. And we even called out in the end of his paper, he said, guys, this is so important in chronic disease that we've really got to get on top of it. But that was in 2002. I'm not sure he's even read this. So here's another interesting one. Engineers always look uh, primarily when you've got a major problem, like say e-test failures in a high volume production line with products, you always look to the ones that are failing early in the life cycle. Because if you have a life cycle expected life for the customer of five years, and you start looking at ones that are failing at 4.5 years in accelerated testing, you're going to get a lot of other noise in there, right? So you look at the early failures, and they'll most speak to cause. This paper from Korea was, was very good, and they actually did that. They looked at all of the things that are really important in young people who get accelerated atherosclerosis, the early life failures. So engineers would love this analysis, and I did. That's what was called out in the paper. And I've marked in red all the things that are intimately linked to dysregulation of insulin and inflammatory problems and not cholesterol. And they mentioned LDL, but you kind of have to. <laughs> Your funding might be cut. So, but you can see there what's important. And they even showed a study and referred to many good studies. One study, the children between ages of six and 19 followed for 25 years Having metabolic syndrome in youth was a 15x increased risk for coronary vascular disease at the 25-year follow-up. Now again, having a high or low LDL between 6 and 19 might be a 0.9 or a 1.2, or it could be anything, to be honest. So that, that's indicative. It's an associative, but all the mechanisms and all the science back it up. So Dr. Kraft, I won't show all his data now. I mean, it, We've gone through it many times before. He did incredible work in the 60s and 70s and studied 15,000 people with five-hour insulin assays. And he cracked this thing way back. But he made that statement, those with cardiovascular disease not identified with diabetes are simply undiagnosed. Now, that's a powerful statement because, in fairness, not all heart disease victims are diabetic. You know, there are special causes and there are other things can go on, but I think he's mostly right. But let's, let's see how right he is with a 2015 study. And this is Euroaspire, and this is very important because they looked at all across Europe, 24 countries ages 18 to 80, all heart disease victims, coronary vascular disease victims, right? Validated. So you've got this perfect picture of all the heart disease across Europe. 
and they looked at their glucose metrics. Now, first they found out of their seven odd thousand, well, a third of them are diabetic, right? And that should tell you something already. But they knew diabetes drove heart disease like nothing else. So they said, okay, we'll take those guys out. We know, we know why they have heart disease. Let's look at the 4,000 non-diabetics and let's see what they've got going on with their glucose. So do people think there's some hidden diabetics in there with craft maybe on the money? Might get a few, but they're non-diabetic, so there shouldn't be too many. So when they looked, a third of them were full diabetic, undiagnosed, yeah? And when they looked a little deeper, they called them high risk for diabetes, but they were diabetic, trust me. Another third were diabetic and would absolutely collapse a craft test. And the remainder, which is getting like small numbers now, they never tested their insulin. And as Kraft knows and we know, unless you test insulin, you can never be sure of diabetes. Myself and Gerber reckon half of those, maybe more, are also diabetic. So roll the whole pie together, bring back in all the diabetics, and 81% are diabetic of all heart disease victims in Europe. And the remainder haven't been tested for insulin. So I think, I think Kraft did pretty well with his prediction, wouldn't you? Yeah. So, I'm not even sure what's next. Ah, a little bit of mechanisms. So I talked for a couple of years about liver as being the seat of insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, leptin problems, and all this dysregulation. I only in the last six months, working with Gabor Ordosi in Hungary, a molecular biologist, uh, worked out that the adipose tissue is actually the initial thing that, that falls, and it's crucially important. Liver's still important, but adipose is huge. So we'll just look at a bit of that. You have people who are metabolically healthy, normal weight, right? They have got subcutaneous adipose tissue in the yellow there, not too much of it, because they're apparently slim. They're insulin sensitive and they're low risk for disease, right? Okay, and their liver is protected by their adipose tissue from the food they eat, even if they cheat a little or eat bad things. Okay, it's not inflamed, their adipose tissue. It can take in the blows, it can let out the energy. It's good, right? Everyone wants to be that guy. Then we've got the metabolically obese, normal weight. Now, these guys are apparently slim, right? But they're insulin resistant and they're hyperinsulinemic and they are high risk, just like a big heavy guy. Right? The risk goes with the, with the physiology, not with the apparent weight. Their, subcu oh, sorry, Rebecca. Their subcutaneous adipose tissue right, is beginning to get inflamed and they've developed depots of visceral adipose tissue, which you can consider like a second shield to protect your liver and your systemic system. Um, they've got a problem, right? a big problem. The next guys are classic. They're metabolically unhealthy obese, you know, very heavy people, they've got enormous amounts of subcutaneous adipose tissue and even bigger VAT, visceral adipose tissue. They've got inflammation, right, a macrophage from immune components have come in to try and mop up the problems with the adipose. But they're letting the bullets through and they're getting systemic insulin resistance because their fat can no longer protect them. They've exceeded their personal fat threshold and they've got problems. And the really interesting guys are the metabolically healthy obese. And basically what's happening with them is they have not exceeded their personal fat threshold or their critical visceral adipose tissue threshold, the CVATT. Got some great papers on that. Um, they have expanded their fat safely. It is not inflamed. They have moderate amounts of visceral, which is not inflamed, right? And they are protecting their system. Their fat's still working great. So they're the four types of people. And it really confuses, you know, doctors, researchers, why some heavy people have no risk, and this is why. So I'll show you one study I love, and I'm going to inflict it on you, because I love it. <laughs> this is really great, though. Here we have insulin-sensitive obese people and insulin-resistant obese, like I just showed you. They're 45 BMI, all of them, big guys. They're all 45 years of age. They're not that old. You'll notice in the left column, the insulin-sensitive obese have actually good biomarkers. Good as mine, or, you know, no problem. Trig over HDL is fine. Glucose infusion rate, which is hugely important, is way up in the healthy range. Insulin-resistant obese are very different, right? Look at their metrics. That's a heart attack within the next few years. No question about it. I just included LDL just for fun, because uh, as you can see, LDL doesn't tell you anything. Now, what's interesting with them is they even look different. 
So the left has the insulin sensitive guy and you have a lot of subcutaneous adipose tissue that's actually not inflamed and is healthy and it hangs outside and folds. The insulin resistant guy on the right though, who has a problem, has a much more kind of bulbous appearance and there's a lot more visceral adipose tissue behind the muscle wall. So they even look different. Um, on the left at the bottom, the micrographs, the insulin sensitive guy, and these are the same scale, these micrographs, has adipose cells that are small and are healthy and there's no black or blue between them. So they have very little macrophage or immune system attack because they're healthy. Look at the insulin resistant guy. They've got hypertrophic, expanded fat cells. And when this fat cell expands, the insulin signaling can no longer work within the cytosol. And then immune system components come in. And would you believe, the people like this, half the weight of their adipose tissue in their visceral compartment can be actually macrophage. So half the weight of their visceral adipose is macrophage, immune system components. And that's the real problem when you exceed your fat threshold. Sick fat, safe fat. And that's what myself and Garode in Ireland like to call it. This is a bit of a complicated graph, but it basically just shows the insulin sensitive guys up in the top right have the same glucose infusion rate as people with 25 BMI. They're metabolically okay. And the insulin resistant guys down lower have a glucose infusion rate in the toilet. They're insulin resistant. It's not the BMI at all. It's the biology and the insulin leptin signaling and a diponectin. So that's a point. One of the most amazing things from this study is, and Dave know, will know this, how often do you get a 0.98 R squared in an experiment with a bunch of humans? There's so much variability, you never get up there. Never. But the guys found that two measures out of all the biometrics they measured, just two of them together, could predict 98% accuracy how insulin resistant or sensitive these guys were. And it's the serum adiponectin, which is a hormone released by healthy fat cells in greater amounts, and the percentage macrophage in the adipose tissue, which I showed you. Those two measures can entirely predict your health level, and they are both measures of adipose tissue health. Whether you're fat or not is not important. How healthy is your adipose tissue? So I'm going to introduce you to the spectrum. We're all on this spectrum. If you can push down the bottom left, you're going to live longer, you're going to be more productive, you're going to feel a damn lot better. If you go up on the right, not so much. On the bottom left, we have people who are truly non-diabetic. They'll pass a craft test, a five-hour insulin assay. They have exquisite insulin and leptin signaling. Their adipose tissue is in great shape in the crosstalk between their adipose and their liver. And all of those adipokines are all working. Those guys live long, right? If they don't get eaten by a lion or whatever. Up in the top right, we've basically got full-blown diabetes, wheels off the wagon, right? And this is disasterville, and that's the end of the spectrum where all hell breaks loose, right? And, and a lot of guys be familiar with that. Basically, bottom left, if you can get down there, you've got healthy hearts, very unlikely to have heart attacks, good health, longevity, vitality, productivity, all the good stuff, right? There's a lot to play for here. Up in the top right, you've got the MIs, the strokes, you've got type 3 diabetes, Alzheimer's, you've got cancers, much higher rates, you've got all the bad stuff, and lack of productivity and lack of quality of life. So there's a lot to play for on the spectrum. I'll note again that on the bottom left, you have big and small people, right? It's not your weight, it's how healthy your tissue is, okay? In the middle, same thing, heavy or slim, all that matters is your insulin signaling and the measures I talked about. And on the top right, you've got highly hyperinsulinemic, insulin resistant people, whether slim or fat. I happen to be in there somewhere, right? I was flagged by the serum GGT in ferritin. Uh, I later got a calcium scan, which is the ultimate test of where you've been on this spectrum for how many years. My supporter, David Bobbitt, who's enabling myself and Jeff to do the book and, and what Jeff mentioned and attend places like this, uh, he got a calcium scan, and all of his metrics were fantastic, even his HbA1c, but he got a one-off calcium scan, and he found out he was in the worst 1% for his age for cardiovascular disease, because the calcium scan never lies, right? The markers can be all over the place, depending on your genetics and your behavior profile. Uh, later, he found out, a few weeks later, his postprandial glucose and insulin were through the roof, 
So he's an undiagnosed diabetic, like the tens and hundreds of millions who die of heart attacks without ever being diagnosed. But what about you, or for doctors in the audience, what about your patients? How do you, how do you see where they are? So, as I mentioned, you can get a calcification scan. That's the last word. On the bottom right, I'm just showing, you can have not one, two, or three risk factors in this study, and all the studies say the same. And as you'll notice, having more risk factors, the risk of mortality slightly rises, like across the yellow bars, the green bars. Yeah, it does. They have some utility. But going back into the page, your calcium score, obviously overwhelmingly dominates on what's really going to happen to you. And this is all cause mortality, same for cardiovascular mortality. You've got 10, 15x risk estimations based on CAC. The risk factors are, unless they're very professionally judged and triangulated, many of them, they're highly fallible. And Jeff showed this earlier in this study, very recent from the Cardiology Imaging uh, Journal, you've got between low and high calcification up to a 37x risk of heart events. So as you know, risk factors give you a 1.5 or a 1.8. Calcification is the last word. You can also use, besides the calcification test, to see where you are and check back later, there are a lot of very good metrics that if you triangulate them all and you can get good in all of them, and they do involve postprandial or post-drinking glucose are the most accurate ones, uh, you can be pretty sure if you get all these right, it's highly likely you're down the bottom left, okay? They're good metrics. Uh, I won't read through them. But how do you fix this? So let's say your metrics are kind of bad. What kind of things do you do? And I'm going to finish with that. What would I do? And what does Jeff do? And you're probably familiar with some of these. Before I go into that, I'm just going to say one thing, that it's not that the hyperinsulinemia insulin resistance necessarily causes all the dysfunction. One interesting thing is that hyperinsulinemia insulin resistance is a fantastic gauge for the human. And I'll give an example. If you have dysbiosis and leaky gut and you're getting lipopolysaccharides and bacteria into your uh, blood supply, right, you get an immune reaction. And they have shown in interventions, not associations, that that will raise insulin and insulin resistance along with the immune reaction. And if you have oxidized lipoproteins, that will trigger insulin resistance and increased insulin. So insulin and insulin resistance are in a fantastic gauge. If engineers were making high volume humans, they would be looking at insulin metrics overwhelmingly to ensure production line quality. It's a great gauge as well as a causal factor, high insulin causes problems. So just to say there's, there's both those things in there. You can't switch off your microbiome and fix it, really, except for the people who are transplanting feces or some of that weird stuff. Um, so you can't switch it off. So what do you do? Well, you do a lot of things to get yourself down the bottom of the spectrum and fix all boats. The first few are, myself and Jeff, eliminate refined carb sugars, eliminate processed foods, not the ones Nick was referring to, I'm talking about the badass stuff. You know, you, you know what the bad processed foods are. You know, it, it's not like when you're in the east of Spain and you get this lovely cured sausage. You, you know what they are. And America is particularly full of them. Uh, unfortunately, and veg oils. Veg oils have no place in a human. Refined vegetable oils whatsoever for many, many reasons I won't get into. So there are eliminations. The next thing you do is low carb, healthy fat, and high quality protein. We favor animal products for the highest quality protein, but you know, you can do it vegetarian if you're careful. Um, this basically will not only give you the best chance to move to the bottom of the spectrum or fix dysfunction if you've already become diabetic, Right? And if you're very diabetic and very dysfunctional, you need to push maybe to the keto end of the spectrum, whereas a lot of people might get away with low carb, so there's choices. This will not only, though, help in that way, it will help with appetite. Because when I switched to this regime, and in two or three weeks, I realized I suddenly had an exquisite control of my appetite. It was actually quite shocking. I could not believe how I could skip meals. So part of my rapid waste loss it was the intervention, but the intervention enabled meal skipping, which accelerated my weight loss. But it was the type of food that allowed me to not eat. It can't do it on a high carb diet, at least I never could for 20 years. So that's really important. And I'll show the next one, fasting behaviors, or myself and Jeff call it meal skipping. Keep it simple. You know, you, you have your evening meal, the next morning you just get some cream in your coffee, you skip breakfast, you maybe get lunch. Some days, right now, the last I ate was yesterday at 6 p.m. 
So I'm kind of doing a 24 hour with no eating, roughly speaking, that's fine. I feel hunger, I feel ghrelin hormone released from my stomach, you know, I feel a hollowness, but it does not affect my mental acuity, you know, it makes me feel good, I feel energized, I feel excited to be here with you. No. <laughs> that, that was an impromptu job. So, but you, you can see what I mean. I'm obviously not feeling tired and lethargic, and I haven't eaten in 24 hours. So I usually fast for 24 before I do a, a talk or a big meeting that's going to be very stressful, because I want to go in at my best. You know, interesting. So fasting. Uh, the last three I won't get into in detail, but there's sun, sleep, and stress. They are very important factors which can completely scupper your efforts in spite of eating the right food. Now, some people can get away with murder with those. Uh, when I went through a period of 18-hour days around a year and a half ago, uh, managing a big issue, uh, huge stress, didn't get much sleep, I put on like around 10 or 12 pounds. Now, I was conscious of it and I let it go because it didn't bother me because the emergency was so big I was working on. But then I pulled it back down later. But, but certainly, sleep and stress and all, it's a big problem for a lot of people. Exercise, I'd recommend Ted Naiman's uh, routine on burn fat, not sugar. He has 15, 20-minute routines with no equipment. You do resistance-type training, okay? You do squats, you do lifts, you do press-ups, and you do it a few times a week, 15, 20 minutes. It boosts mitochondria, muscle buildup, and you don't need to do a whole lot if you do the right exercise. And supplements, I won't go into detail, they'll be in the book, but we have a lot of favored ones, and particularly potassium, magnesium, and the salts, if you're on a low-carb diet or a keto diet, is hugely important, and it's caused a lot of people to fail, to not be adequate. If you do all that, and that's gone wrong, the font, but anyway, there is ancestral health, which can be achieved by anyone, if you understand all of the levers and if you apply them properly, uh, you can get there, right? The overwhelming majority of people can get down there. And if you don't, unfortunately, you pretty meant, oh, one last thing. There are metrics as well to tell you your waypoints in the journey and there's calcification to tell you every couple of years that you're not progressing. So there are measures there. But if you don't do that, you've got metabolic mayhem awaiting you. And sadly, unfortunately, the majority of adult Americans and the majority of, of people in our world today are pretty much just heading inexorably up to that end of the spectrum. And they don't need to. They just need the knowledge and they can move to safety. Thank you. <laughs>